screens. <laughs> uh, big welcome back to the G2Z online event series. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, apologies for the slight delay. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. My name is Nell Thompson and I'm the coordinator of the National Getting to Zero or as we call it, the G2Z program. I'll be hosting the webinar for you today, but we have, we'll be blaming any glitches on Zoom or the internet gods and we can do, <laughs> we can do that already. Um, so Getting to Zero was developed by the Animal Welfare League of Queensland and they continue to support it to this day. G2Z offers its consulting, support and educational services at no charge to local governments and not-for-profits across Australia. Our focus continues to be on companion animal welfare and management issues, such as strategy, legislation, operations, programs and community engagement, working towards reducing intake to pounds and shelters and keeping pets in their homes. We invite people to take a look at our website at g2z.org.au, sign up for our regular e-news, connect with us via social media and to get in contact with us to see if we can help or to have a chat about the issues that are facing your community or organisation. So to today's session, once I hand over to our presenter, there will be around 50 minutes of presentation and around 10 minutes of question time once the presentation has concluded. The recording of this webinar will be accessible via our website to everyone to watch at any time. We're going to ask that everyone mutes themselves during the presentation unless our presenter indicates otherwise. And if you have questions, you can start putting them in the Q&A section and we'll get through as many as we can at the end of the session. If you have very quick questions that relate to your understanding of the content, put your hand up and we'll try to get to them during the presentation. As always, please excuse any working from home background noises that may filter through. I am very happy to introduce to you today, Kate Kemp. Kate is the Operational Manager of Compassby Animal Shelter, a position she's held since 2010 when the shelter was managed by the Lost Dogs Home and then transitioned across to council management in 2016. The Campaspe Shire Council Animal Shelter won the Companion Animal Rescue Awards Outstanding Council Animal Shelter Award in 2018. Kate grew up in Auckland, New Zealand, attending Long Bay College before starting her chosen career as a veterinary nurse in 1994. She's obtained a number of qualifications over the years and has worked in a range of roles in the animal field, including at the Auckland Zoo, as an educator and program manager at a TAFE, and as a qualified veterinary nurse within private and animal welfare practices throughout New Zealand, United Kingdom, and finally Australia. Kate is passionate about animal welfare and part of her role enjoys hosting and attending events to increase the focus of community engagement and understanding of the animal shelter and the services it provides. So over to you, Kate. Thanks, Nell. Um, I hope you can all hear me and I apologise for any um, technical difficulties. This is my first time on Zoom. Um, let's see if we can get this to work. Yes, okay, cool. All right, so um, just so you know, the Shire of Compassby is located in north central Victoria. It's about 180 kilometres um, north of central Melbourne. Um, so it covers an area of approximately 4,500 square kilometres. And we have an estimated population of um, over 37,000 people. It's a predominantly rural area, um, so lots of dairy farming, vegetables, feedlotting, cat, beef, yeah, beef cattle, um, tourism, etc. cetera. Um, in the last financial year, council had 7,881 dogs and 2,538 cats registered with council. So um, as Nell said, uh, originally uh, the Compassby Animal Shelter was run by the Lost Dogs Home and prior to that, the RSPCA. Um, at the end of October in 2016, the Compassby Shire Council took the services or the management in-house for the first time. 
Um, obviously, we had, Canvas Fish Eye Council was deemed as a proprietor under uh, the Code of Practice for the Management of the Dogs and Cats in Shelters and Pounds in Victoria. And given their statutory role um, re in relation to the control of domestic and non-domestic animals, um, they've brought the two functions together, providing a full service for animal surrender seizures um, and adoptions. So uh, they chose to continue along with the, the being a pound and shelter. Uh, covered that. <laughs> um, Sorry, back to that one. Um, on average, we see around 1,100 um, felines and canines impounded each year. Um, so about 60% of that are felines and 40% of that are canines, which I'm sure most people have a similar theme. So um, in March of uh, 2017, um, we commenced uh, the volunteer program at the Compassion Animal Shelter. So there was one prior uh, when it was the Lost Dogs Home. Um, and then obviously with the changeover in management, um, council then held discussions with internal and external stakeholders um, to work out whether or not having a volunteer program would be suitable for the shelter. Um, they already had a council framework um, for volunteers. So that was easily easy to be applied to, to the animal shelter. Um, in their discussions, they, their overall findings were that the majority of the risks carry a low risk profile, um, that volunteering of this type is anticipated and being specifically catered for in Victorian legislation. And the use of expression of interest process um, helps to ensure that white volunteers are fitted to the available roles and that more than likely the benefits will outweigh the risks. So once council approved us to go ahead with these volunteer programs, we did um, quite a bit of media and we did a community information session um, of an evening and we had around 40 participants um, from the Shire attend that meeting. So within the Compassion Shire Council, um, they have a number of volunteer programs um, within the library services, the Port of the Chuka Discovery Centre, the community support services, and obviously us at the animal shelter, which tends to be quite popular. So all that information is advertised on the council webpage. Um, and when volunteer positions become available, they are advertised there. So we have two roles um, within the animal shelter. One of them is animal shelter support. So that's where volunteers come in to the shelter, um, do a two hour shift where they literally spend time with the adoption animals, um, helping them, helping to provide additional level of care, um, all the enrichment they need. So playing with them, giving them some socialization, grooming, helping with bathing if they need it. Um, some basic training for your dogs, getting them out for a walk, um, getting them used to sitting and walking through doors nicely and approaching people gently. And obviously just the simple basics of uh, getting a dog to relax and be quiet when a new person comes into the room. Um, so all of these activities obviously help to keep all of our adoption animals in really good physical and psychological shape, as well as helping us to improve their chances of being adopted out because it's not just the shelter staff that they're seeing every day, they're seeing different people coming in. So within that, there are basically 10 roles. So we do Monday to Friday, and there's two shifts, a 10 till 12 or a two till four. Um, so basically there are 10 different people who come in throughout the week, giving those animals different people to interact with um, and starting to get used to the, in a lot of cases, particularly with dogs, they see the workers there in their uniform and they recognize that when somebody else comes in, they're not sure who they are, they can cower to the back or they can jump around and carry on like pork chops, so to speak. Um, so the volunteers certainly help with giving them different experiences. So the profiles for these volunteers is obviously a desire to volunteer. They do have to be over the age of 18 years. 
um, a strong passion for animals. Uh, previous experiences of looking after animals is always desirable, but you know, this is simple as having a family pet at home. Um, a general understanding of what the role of the shelter does helps them to understand, but they tend to learn more when they come in, which is a, a real positive. Um, obviously the ability to follow the guidance of the shelter staff um, and being able to come in for those few hours each week. In the ideal situation, we have them the same day and hour each week. Um, but in some cases, there might be people who can only do it fortnightly, so we can switch them around in those days and hours. Then we have our animal foster care. Um, so this is a, another really important drive and probably one of the most important, particularly in kitten season. Um, so people are obviously, um, one, they can provide just some short-term relief, um, which is a vital form of support um, that mainly requires maybe a weekend or a week to give a um, longer-term resident some time out of the shelter. Um, and then obviously to the longer term, which is your juvenile or mum and litter um, fosters. So these could be from two to eight weeks of time, depending on obviously the age of the animals. Um, so with this again, it's, it's much the same as uh, in shelter support, um, but obviously there's a bit more involved because they are taking these animals into their homes and they are caring for them solely on their own. Um, with the support of us, but we're obviously not there every day. So um, having a little bit more extra experience and understanding, um, being able to follow obviously our written foster care plans, the time and willingness to spend with some of these animals that need just a bit more, um, and obviously open to us doing inspections on a regular basis. Um, we tend to do inspections, um, obviously, once somebody's approved as a foster carer, which I'll go into a bit further later um, and then we do it every 12 months but obviously have within our um, contracts that we we may do those um, more regularly dependent on the situation and the animal that's in foster care. Um, our foster cares are supplied with all the appropriate food, treats, litter, bowls, leashes, medications etc etc. Um, as well as obviously guides and foster care agreements to help them with their particular foster. Um, when council was looking into the volunteer um, services, they uh, had concerns around um, obviously whether we supply or we don't supply. Um, obviously supplying um, the supplies to the foster carers, they're looking at the cost factor, whereas if they supplied it themselves, obviously it would save council. But all in all, um, it, it doesn't save in the sense um, we were going to always have to buy those supplies, um, whether the animal remained in our care or went to foster care. So um, we actually save in the long term of them going out to foster care because they're not sitting within the shelter and taking up space. And obviously they're getting a lot more enrichment and socialization that they need. So a very valuable tool to have. Um, <clears throat> Insurance, so under council, volunteers are insure, insured as volunteer workers. So they're still classed as workers um, whilst they're carrying out their authorised activities with council. Um, but they're not entitled to work cover. Um, as there's a lim limited liability and insurance for injury. Um, so the insurance is through MAV insurance um, through the public and products liability and professional indemnity policy. Um, so if they were to be driving one of our council vehicles, which they don't within our roles, but within other roles in council they do, then um, they are obviously covered. But um, within the role of a foster carer, where they're obviously coming out to collect the animals and taking them home, um, they obviously need to get their, make ensure that they have their own insurance to cover their car. Um, what's not covered is obviously any criminal, act, criminal activity, such as um, obviously um, driving incidents, dishonest or reckless activities, any personal property loss or damage, ambulance costs, so as we are all encouraged to do, to get ambulance membership, 
Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Basically, it's it's the volunteers are covered um, for any sort of basic injuries that were if they were on site. Um, but um, it's more of what Medicare can cover. Uh, the, our annual um, animal foster care agreements um, were also reviewed by council's governance team and our council insurances to ensure it was all signed off. Um, obviously within accordance with the legislation that uh, council has to and every most workplaces have to, um, volunteers uh, also have to be conducted within accordance to lots of legislation, such as the Local Government Act 2020, Occupational Health and Safety Act 20, uh, 2004, Equal Opportunity Act 2010, Racial Discrimination Act 1975, Disability Act, the Disability Discrimination Act 1922, Australian Human Rights Responsibility Act 2006, and Age Discrimination Act 2004, just to name a few. Um, also under obviously the volunteer programs, council has um, a number of approved policies and procedures that they also have to abide by. Um, so privacy and data protection, occupational health and safety, our employee code of conduct, our social media policy, the respect and equal opportunity, gender equity, equity respect and equal opportunity, grievance and disciplinary action. So they are classed as staff. Um, <clears throat> so the insurance side of things is obviously controlled by our government's team. So they could probably talk for a lot longer about that than I could, but they, these are the basics. We also have our, obviously our local area guidelines or work instructions as they can be known um, and uh, making sure that they are provided with the supervision and guidance and advice that they need. Um, when also checking of doing discussions around opening up to volunteers. Um, the government's team stated that the volunteers that apply are, are likely to do so because of pre-existing interest within animal care and will therefore likely be aware of the risks and issues um, prior to us explaining them to them. So Use the use of an EOI expression of interest process and doing reference checks um, definitely helps to ensure the right volunteers are found to fit the available roles. So for recruitment, um, we recruit in accordance with the council's recruitment and selection process, uh, procedure. So when council first started with the volunteer programs, um, people would just send in expressions of interest um, at any time. And we did end up with quite a big backlog because obviously you've only got so many positions available, particularly for the in shelter care. Um, so we had a very large wait list um, and obviously was a bit upsetting for people because they were sat on there for so, so long until a, another position came available. Um, Council has reviewed that recruitment and selection. Um, and in the last year, it's now in accordance with the same as employees. So when an, a position becomes available, it will be advertised on the website um, for two weeks and people can place in their expressions of interest in. So they don't have to do a, a big lengthy application. It is literally just an expression of interest form to fill out and just a little bit more information about themselves. So um, obviously we we base recruitment on the merit. Um, we make it fair and open, and we don't show any favoritism or discrimination. So our volunteers um, are only engaged to do things that a staff member wouldn't be in, um, engaged to do. Well, obviously our staff do provide enrichment for the animals, but it's to say that the volunteers are not there um, cleaning the cages, feeding, answering phones, all that sort of thing. They are, are they are, their sole purpose is to provide enrichment for the animals in our adoption areas. Um, so they are only spend the time with the animals that 
have been assessed um, as suitable for rehousing. Um, I feel like I'm missing a step here. Let's go. Oh, yeah. So recruitment steps is obviously we have to um, review the a recruitment needed. Um, so is there a, an opening available? We also always have to review the position description. So same as staff, volunteers have a position description. Um, and we ensure that each time we go out to recruit that that is up to date um, so that we're not set, uh, setting them up with the wrong information. We have to do an authority to recruit form to be signed off by management prior to advertising going ahead. And then, as I stated before, they advertise on the website um, for up to two weeks. Um, we also obviously pop that out on our social media to say that they're um, that we are recruiting. Um, so we have our own social media for the animal shelter on the Facebook, um, but council also has their own Facebook page that they will also put the information out on as well. So once um, applications come in, we obviously compile those applications. Um, we take a look through obviously their experiences at fitting the key selection criteria. Um, then get it, um, them selected and booked in for an interview. So in the interview, it's, again, we still do an interview, but it's not um, as, I guess, invasive as uh, becoming an employee. So you don't have a panel of three, you don't have a 20 minute interview. Um, it's a little bit lighter. So the interviews are with myself and I do quite often try to have either the volunteer coordinator uh, for council or another one of my staff present as well, because um, it's good to have the two different views and also ensures that we are being fair and equitable to the applicants. Um, in the interview, we will, we just ask some basic questions. Um, most of it's covered obviously in the original application. Um, so we just ask them to sort of describe what they think the role entails. Um, and what demands there might be to see if they've got a, a good understanding of what we're asking people to do. Um, obviously what appeals to them. Um, uh, that they, becoming a volunteer, they do become a part of our team. Um, so can they demonstrate to us in their work life, what sort of teamwork that they've been involved in and how they would contribute to our team because uh, they are a very vital part of the team. Um, obviously their experiences with animals, um, health and safety, do, do they understand the health and safety aspects of working with animals? Um, obviously talking about confidentiality as well. And then obviously in the foster care, um, asking them about their home environment, um, why they think they are suitable um, to do home foster care um, and to whether they own or rent their, their home. Um, so do they need to get permission um, if they are renting to go ahead? Also, obviously an opportunity for them to ask us some more questions. Um, it's as in any recruitment, it goes both ways. Um, the candidate is also interviewing you um, as well as us interviewing them. So we always have to remember that it goes both ways. Um, as with uh, Victorian government legislation, um, all council workers, including volunteers, uh, must have proof of double COVID vaccination. Um, so we don't ask for that at the time, we'll ask if they are vaccinated, um, but only one member of council will um, obtain that proof so that we're keeping the confidentiality prior to moving forward. Um, obviously do reference checks as well. Um, again, uh, we still do two reference checks, uh, but the questions obviously can't, aren't quite as intense. Um, they don't have to be managers, they could be um, family or friends, so people that know them in their home environment and their background of looking and caring for animals. And then the next step is um, if those sides check out, 
is doing a home inspection um, of the foster carer. Um, so this part is, is timely. Um, well, the whole steps are, but we'll go through the challenges in a bit. Um, so we will go out and obviously inspect their home to ensure that it's suitable for the types of animals that they're looking to foster. Um, looking at the areas where they're going to keep them, um, obviously giving some maybe some feedback. In some cases, they may need to just make some adjustments and we might have to go back again. Uh, but nothing is going ahead until we're comfortable that the home is a safe environment for our animals to be cared for in. If the um, applicants are unsuccessful, uh, we give them a call to notify them and we will provide them with feedback. So it's not just a straight up, sorry, no, um, thanks for coming. Um, obviously making sure that they do have the feedback uh, the same as people when they apply for a position so that they know what they need to look at to change maybe in the future to become a successful applicant. So successful applicants um, obviously are called to advise that they are successful. And then the paperwork trail begins. Um, so we have to fill in an employee payroll details form to be approved by management, um, then it's sent on to the volunteer and training coordinator at council, who uh, then organises the volunteer letter of offer, sends them out the copy of the role description, our volunteer agreement, um, our volunteer care handbook. Um, it also compromises of the safety induction. Once they've received all of that documentation, then um, we organise a day and a time for them to come into the shelter. Um, where I will sit down and do a local area induction with them. So whether they be a foster carer or an animal shelter support volunteer, um, we still do the local area induction because the foster carers are still coming on site. But it's also good for them to know what the other roles are um, and a bit more about them, about our structure, how, how we do things, and obviously to go through our legislation that we have to abide by our health management, policies, OHS, zoonosis being very important working with animals, um, animal behaviour and handling, <coughs> and um, positive reward to training, uh, confidentiality and enrichments. So covering a number of assets to try and set them up for success. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are challenges to initiating these types of programs and time is one of the biggest ones. So the time for the recruitment, obviously the, the paper trail you've got to go through to, to get the recruitment up. The recruitment's up for two weeks, <coughs> depending on the amount of applications you get or depending on how long it takes you to, to whittle them down. Um, obviously doing the interviews, doing your reference checks and then for your foster programs, doing your home inspections. So that all takes time um, for obviously a foster carer because there's additional steps with the home inspections. It can take a few couple of weeks, obviously, to be able to set the times in to be able to go out and do the house inspection um, and then move on to the next steps. <coughs> the induction, again, we get them in for a couple of hours um, to show them around and, and take them through that um, on-site induction. We don't want to rush anything. It needs to make sure that we do give them the information that they need. For your foster carers, um, through the Victorian legislation, um, every single animal that goes out into foster care has to have an individual agreement. So they have to be assessed by the veterinarian, which we would want that done anyway. Um, and then we have to devise an agreement for that animal that covers everything that that animal's care requires. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we do have um, care books that we've designed so that they can reflect back to those. Um, so we might, to minimize, I guess, a bit on the agreement, the stating to see pages five to seven, if it's a juvenile or pages eight and nine, if it's just for instance, if it was a mum and kittens, but we also obviously go through with them when they're there exactly what these animals require and when. 
Um, vet assessment for us, we don't have a vet on site. So it's obviously making an appointment to get them to the vets. So the time to the travel, getting the appointment, trying to make everything sort of work in um, can be quite timely. But again, benefits outweigh the challenges as much as time is uh, um, taken away there is time gained within the shelter itself uh, because these animals are placed out into homes so therefore freeing up space within the shelter so um, you know you could be having a few out at once um, so there gives you six cages back that um, that's time that you don't have to clean unfortunately in kitten season as we all know they are very quickly refilled um, the community is really important and having these programs helps um, to build your relationships with your local community and helps them to understand better what you actually do. The animals, well, it's massive for the animals. As I said before, they're seeing different people, not just the same people day in, day out. So their enrichment and their socialisation is just greatly improved. Um, so rewards definitely outweigh the challenges. So since our foster care program was implemented by council, um, we have placed 379 animals into foster care. So that's consisting of 46 adult cats, 326 kittens and seven dogs um, with a 94% success rate for the moving on to rehoming post foster care. Um, unfortunately with uh, mums and bubs or juveniles, you do see some unfortunate unassisted deaths in juveniles, um, but uh, a, a very low percentage given the number that we do go through in the end. So kitten season is a very busy time. There are times when we might have uh, mum and bubs that if she has a large litter, that we are a little concerned about how they're going to cope, that we may keep those in the shelter um, for longer to ensure obviously that we can get them checked regularly and that we're happy that they are progressing well. Um, and once that we're confident and comfortable and the vet is comfortable, um, then we would look at putting them out to care. Um, so in March this year, one of our um, foster carers, um, Valerie, it did a lovely little article in the Compassity Times and um, she originally started with us in an uh, animal shelter support role in 2018 um, and learned a bit more about what foster care was. So then in 2019, she became a animal foster carer. Um, so she was unable to dedicate her two hours a week anymore for us at the shelter but she changed that around and, and took the animals home for us. Um, she, since obviously COVID has settled, we've gone back to some sort of normal. Um, she has been spending a bit more time traveling again, but that doesn't stop her from being a foster carer. If she can take some for a, a couple of days or a couple of weeks, it benefits us. Um, as you'll see by her article, um, she really enjoys um, helping out. Um, she has cared for over 30 kittens um, in her short time um, and she really loves having them there and, and helping them to learn. It's, uh, she does find it hard to let them go at the end of the day um, but obviously the reward is she gets to have the love and the companionship and she gets to help them grow and give them the best chance of being rehoused. Um, so she feels like she's got a pet, but yeah, she doesn't have all the responsibility of having to care for it all the time. Um, the fact that we supply everything makes easier for them as well. Um, they always have someone they can contact, generally me, um, at any time, including weekends, if they have any concerns. Um, and um, I quite often will do house calls, uh, so I guess there's another time part you need to be a bit dedicated but sometimes that's what is needed particularly when they're first starting out um, in foster care um, but as you can see Valerie thoroughly enjoys it and she encourages everyone to to get on board in our other role um, shelter support we have Christelle Christelle's been volunteering with me for 11 years now 
So she was with us when um, it was a lost dogs home. And then once council took over, as soon as they advertised for volunteers, Christo had no hesitation whatsoever in reapplying for the, for the role. And of course, was successful. Um, uh, Christelle um, has mild autism and intellectual disability. Uh, her passion for animals is just completely infectious and her knowledge is second to none. Um, she is an absolute vital part of our team. She, she knows those animals 10 times better than we do half the time. So sometimes it might be we haven't had a chance to spend some, enough time with an animal. We're taking people in, we're giving them a rough idea of what we've seen about this animal. Christelle's in there, we're getting her feedback um, to help us uh, update these potential adopters or whether it would be the best suit for, her, for them or not. Um, she takes great selfies when she's in the shelter. Um, so that's another thing that's important to do to encourage them to have their cameras or their phones on them and taking photos and sending them through so we can update their profiles. Um, she gives us feedback every time she's in there, uh, letting us know who gets on with who, um, any quirks or anything that they have. So again, we can update those profiles if it's not already in there which really boosts the chances of these animals being adopted. The more you can do that, the better. And, they, and these guys can get some fantastic photos. We have other support options as well. So obviously being having to be over the age of 18 restricts people <coughs> for being able to volunteer because um, a lot of the younger generation would like to. So I've developed an enrichment guide so that people can um, take these home and see what what we, we do to make up enrichments by using household items. Um, we have a number of community groups that get involved with this, um, which is also great. So we recently uh, approached by the Girl Guides who want to get an affiliation and they were really excited about the enrichment guide. So what they'll do is they'll make some up um, and then they'll organize a the time they can come in and they can hand out that enrichment to the animals. So it's a win-win. Um, so it's real basic, really basic things. I haven't put the full guide in just pictures, but um, it's a really good idea to sort of let people know what things are valuable to you. So newspapers for lining cages, um, a simple thing that people get their newspaper delivered every day, but they don't think about it actually being used for anything else, but putting in the recycling bin. Cardboard boxes, toilet rolls, um, bottles, bottle tops, blankets, towels, Ropes, uh, sheets. Um, so we make things like pinwheels. So nice and easy for the younger kids to make. They, their animals can play with them, then they can send some out for us too. Um, we use the toilet rolls for canine treats as well. Bonbons for the cats. Uh, hanging balls, a little bit trickier to make, um, but really great for sticking on the front of the cat cages, they love playing with them, usually destroy them very quickly. But again, something that somebody who can't dedicate their time to the shelter um, could do sitting on their couch and feel like they're contributing. Uh, Pom-poms, I'm sure everyone's made them the old fashioned way. You can actually buy pom-pom makers now, so you don't have to do it with the cardboard. We make our own rope toys out of old sheets, um, snuffle mats, obviously out of old blankets. Um, tennis rope toys, scent pouches, the list goes on. Um, we also uh, cater for work experience. So um, this is a really helpful tool as well um, for those that are contemplating or pursuing a vocation in the field of animal care. Um, it gives them the experience that they need. Um, it gives you an extra pair of hands. Um, and it also gives you the possibility of um, opening up your casual pool um, of staff because when they're coming to do their work experience, um, they could potentially be somebody that would be suitable for recruitment when you're looking for casuals. So quite a handy tool for them and for you. Um, so the placement's only available to obviously students from approved educational institutions such as public, private schools, TAFEs and universities. For the tertiary students, um, they usually have to do an 80 hour 
placement. So we asked them to do two weeks, Monday to Friday, 8.15 to 5. And high school students, just the one week, 8.30 to 4.30, Monday to Friday. Um, we do have a number of people who ask if they could do one day a week. Um, but that doesn't really assist with their training um, or obviously the consistency within the shelter. If they can do that set week or two weeks, they're going to benefit more from it um, and, and the animals in your care as well. So in closing, if I haven't raced through too fast because I'm nervous, um, <laughs> Just be mindful of um, space constraints. So don't have too many volunteers on at once because um, nobody's going to benefit from that. Um, whilst it's sort of, it is good if you've got lots of animals in the space too, you can have a few volunteers in different areas and then switch them around. Um, we're obviously a bit smaller, so just one volunteer at a time. Um, yeah, make sure your steps for recruitment are clear. No promises are made and, it, and especially for your foster carers with the extra steps that you've got to go through. Um, making sure that um, everyone knows that they are a valuable part of the team, um, that they know their roles. Um, they're obviously given some annual handling and behaviour training. Make sure you utilise your volunteers, um, as I said, with Christelle. Um, helps build up some really awesome adoption profiles, boosts the chances of a quick adoption. Um, by updating those photos and those profiles on a regular basis. Um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's many a successful volunteer programs out there um, within council shelters, pounds, uh, rescue groups, oh, everywhere. There's plenty of really good volunteer programs. Um, remember that the risks associated with the establishment of volunteer program are primarily low and are manageable through application of good practice, process and risk management. Um, engage with your community. They really want to help. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I'm not sure whether I can put my video on or not because Hi. Kate is hosting, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, any questions? So, well done. <laughs> You're a pro at this already. Oh, I, haven't I, don't got, know. I haven't got anything in the Q&A. Did anyone have any questions that they wanted to ask? You can raise your hand or unmute yourself. If not, I've got lots of questions. So. <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> no, it was a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. So you've answered a lot of the questions um, that I had. I wanted to see whether I could just um, get you to expand a bit more on what the positive impacts of the program has been beyond the shelter walls. So within the community, what sort of things have you seen? Like, have, you know, is there a change in the communications around what happens in the facility? out in the community or a change in attitudes or oh, this it's certainly uh, much more positive than community community because you've got pe people from the community in there so you're not they're not staff telling them um we do well pre-covid times and hopefully again soon we'll get back out doing some adoption and microchipping events as well and we we take our volunteers along to that too um Fantastic. And um, Chris Dell in particular has grown so much over the 11 years. Um, I'm so proud of her. Um, mm. That now when we go to adoption events, you kind of have to grab her and pull her back because she's just running to people to <laughs> tell them all about it, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it is really a positive. We recently um, attended the Achuka Moama um, Volunteer Day at the Achuka Library. Um, and it was great to be out in the community again. And everyone was walking past. We were making enrichment while we were standing there. And they were just looking at us and then going, that's what you do with our rubbish. Oh, wow. So they were giving so us nice. stuff, but they didn't know what we, they were doing. So again, that um, really brought that positive back around and um, got more people sort of engaging and, and thinking we were integrated with other volunteer groups and looking at what can we all do for each other. Um, yep. So, yeah, it's certainly the volunteers, massively the foster carers, um, you know, in-house in and out-house, um, they're spreading the word and, and 
making people realise that, yeah, every, not everything is just coming in and getting put down. It's actually yeah. being cared for um, and that we're doing everything we can to rehouse what is rehomeable. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I think we've got a question from Kay. Is it possible to know the basic commands you teach to make a dog more viable for adoption and that, and about the cheap enrichment toys. And actually, I was going to ask whether you might be prepared to share your enrichment guide, whether I could pop that yeah. on the website with the recording of this session. Yeah, and no then... problems at all. Yeah, more okay. than happy to share. Um, it's just different ideas that people come up with. and they're, Absolutely. It's great. Yeah, it saves a bit of money when you do yeah. it yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, most definitely. Um, obviously, we're just trying to, when they're in our care, we try to um, give them the basic, very basic commands. We um, also put signs up on our cages. So if you've got a dog that likes to bark and annoy everybody, the, you know, give me a treat when I'm quiet. Um, give me a treat when I've got all four paws on the ground. Yeah, great. Um, all those sorts of signs that we put up there so people have a, a direct indication. When they're in adoptions, um, we've got, well, everywhere, we've got treat bags on the front. So we also encourage when we have members of the public to coming for a walkthrough, um, to have a look as, or when you go past, if if any of them have been quiet, can you please throw them a treat? So yeah. you're getting used to other people doing that as well. Um, and then obviously getting them out for those basics of, um, you know, exiting through the door uh, nicely, um, the basics of sit. The sort of toilet training obviously is a little bit harder, but um, with, with the dogs, we're very thankful that they don't last very long. Um, we haven't needed assistance with dogs in a very long time. They're, once they're desexed and ready to go, they're gone within a week maximum, um, usually 24 to 48 hours. <laughs> Amazing. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. Um, so... And just back to Christelle, she sounds amazing. She might might be a good candidate for the Rescue Awards volunteer category. I don't know whether you've ever thought about yeah, putting I, her up for that, but I certainly did, and she got to the yeah finalist list, but didn't make it through. So oh, right. great! Okay, well, you, <laughs> the, you can always try the next year. So um, she sounds amazing. Um, in terms of uh, volunteer appreciation, what sort of things is it within your capacity to you know, really, I guess, demonstrate to the volunteers um, how much you guys all do appreciate them. Uh, so obviously within our capacity, Council um, has obviously done some volunteer appreciation stuff with this upcoming week um, and they have issued them a pen. Um, we uh, integrate them into obviously our meetings and yeah. at Christmas, time um, we have a big team meeting with the volunteers as well um, so we obviously have some lunch at that time too great and ensure yeah. that um, everyone's a part of the meeting and understands how valued they are plus yeah. obviously we talk to them every single day when they're in and yeah. and when they provide us with feedback it's the appreciation is given on that level as well yeah yeah it's important part of things isn't it oh it is and as I say that they're the one of the most vital parts of your team yeah. Um, there's so much we can learn from them and vice versa. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, they that's amazing. Um, and just back to the risk management stuff, do you have any idea of, um, you know, the number of sort of incidents that the volunteers might be involved in at the shelter? Like, you know, in oh, terms of, um, yeah. Very, very small amount. Um, yeah. <laughs> Christelle, um, touch wood. <laughs> yeah, touch wood. Um, Christelle does have a, a number of sort of odd scratches here and there, as you do when you're sitting in with the cats. Um, so there are a couple that we've had to say, don't let this one sit on your chest, please. <laughs> um, and call us when it's ready to go back in the cage because that's when it gets a little bit shirty. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, touching wood, um, us as staff get more incidents yeah. than, than our volunteers because they are dealing with those ones that we've got known behaviours. So then they're yeah. not putting being put at risk, um, but obviously yeah. working particularly with cats, you can't control those claws all the time. For sure, <laughs> yeah. And that's certainly what I hear from other um, council shelters too, that 
really the risk is a lot lower than probably management and administrators think that it might be. So it's just communicating that. And I think having uh, example programs like yours will really give people some great evidence to go to to their management and say, well, look, this is already running and this is how it's happening and, you know, all that sort of thing. So you sharing everything today is um, really valuable and um, the fact that people will be able to access the recording um, at any time and and learn from it, take to staff meetings and things, the effect will be ongoing. So we really appreciate that. Um, I actually have one more question, if you don't mind. Sorry, I will shut up soon. Um, But in terms of um, budgetary value, have you guys ever looked at what the financial um, implications have been? Um, Yeah, because you've talked about um, a lower length of stay. You've talked about um, obviously not needing to care for animals in the facility if they're out in Costa, um, you know, all those sorts of things, probably an increased adoption rate as well because of the good name, you know, within the community. Has that ever been viewed from a a financial point of view? Has a dollar value ever been put on that? Um, I I know at the beginning that was something that they were quite interested in because obviously some volunteer programs, the, the volunteers have to supply their own supplies. Right. Um, and then others, they supply them. Mm. Um, to looking into it further, I would say we probably haven't gone that far into the yeah. monetary side of things. Um, but again, so we had to buy some crates. Um, that's yep. probably your biggest outlay. And yeah. they're, not, they're not that expensive. No. You've, re- you've already got the trays. You've already got the food. You've got to buy all yeah. those things already. They're already in use that's at the right. shelter. So. To yeah. the only the only real cost is time is your time for having yep. to do all the recruitment and the and the yes. house checks um, and buying the crates to set you up but then you've got the crates for years so um, yeah there's there's not a lot yeah. in it I don't think um, no you're, you're it would saving be an time on the other project mm. yeah absolutely and and money I think too you know I mean if we look at what our um, daily cost of care is and uh, which is not something that people typically work out but you're probably looking at at least $30 a day even if you're just decreased Mm. yeah that's right so even if you're just decreasing your average length of stay um you know there's massive savings just there isn't there so there is yeah all right well if there aren't any more questions and I don't don't oh hang on sorry I do have one um do you feel from Anne thank you Anne do you feel that it's necessary to do home visits for cat foster cares compared to dogs um we do for both um because we need to obviously establish these are our animals we need to establish where they're going to be um, housed and how they're going to be Mm -hmm. cared for in that environment Um, Mm -hmm. so i think both are vitally important and particularly um your mums and bubs bubs get off running and hide in all sorts of fun places um so making sure that the home environment is safe as well Um, okay so yeah both sides of it definitely Yep. And a question from Craig. Do you have a desexing program for the community? Sadly, at this point in time, we don't. Um, okay. But it is something, obviously, that we continue to put forward to council. Um, yep. So uh, it's a okay. to do. Yeah. Yep. And he's also asked, what do you charge for, what are your adoption fees? Um, and is registration included when you adopt? Okay, so um, adoption fees obviously vary each year. Um, as anyone in council will know, they have to go up a little bit each year. Okay. Um, but uh, dependent on the situation. So dogs um, at the moment, an adult dog is, oh, I'm testing my knowledge, my memory, uh, <laughs> 370. Um, a puppy's 460. Um, and a dog over the age of eight um, is 180 from memory, so we they're half the price. Uh, yeah. Cats and kittens, um, so we have a price range. So generally, um, so what a cat currently should be is 105, and a kitten currently should be 170. We are currently charging $15 for an adult cat and $60 for a kitten, so that we can keep well, moving out of the facility. Go you! That is a fantastic <laughs> so, strategy. It really yeah. is. 
we do um, a lot of adoption drives. So um, it's quite Brilliant. different with the cats and kittens for them to actually be at their normal cost. Um, registration um, at this stage is additional um, to the adoption fee. Um, again, something else that we have in our domestic animal management plan to, to look into reviewing um, what we can do in that, that space. Yep, fantastic. Oh, that's amazing. Really, really cool stuff. Um, you're definitely uh, leaders in the space. So I very much appreciate your time today, all the effort. Um, it's been wonderful. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, keep an eye on our social media and e-news for the announcement of the next webinar for uh, June. June already, I can't quite believe it. Um, but, yeah, thanks very much. Um, if there's any topics or presenters that anyone would like to see covered in this series, please let me know. We're uh, very open to suggestions. So uh, we want to hear from you all. But anyway, thank you so much. Thanks, Kate. Really appreciate it. Take care, everybody. See you at the next one. Thank you.